The Memorial Day season is the unofficial start of a big summer travel season, and that means a lot of driving and flying. When we talk about greenhouse gas emissions and transportation, we largely focus on cars and trucks since they generate the most. But the aviation sector is under pressure to reduce its carbon footprint, too. In the second of two reports, science correspondent Miles O'Brien looks at efforts to create greener fuels for the skies. A half mile outside the fence of Boston's Logan Airport, Carlos Flores is helping grease the skids for an ambitious goal, erasing the carbon footprint of airline travel. He's at a wing stop, harvesting used cooking oil, or UCO. It contains hydrocarbons and can be refined into sustainable aviation fuel, or SAF. UCO to SAF, from wing stop to wing tank. Every time I fly back home in Brazil, I think about it, like, oh, maybe I help put some fuel in here, you know? He drives for Mahoney Environmental, a subsidiary of Neste, a Finnish oil refiner that is now a global leader in renewable fuel production, including sustainable aviation fuel. Dave Kimball is Mahoney's president and CEO. So the really cool thing about cooking oil is it's already had one life, and now we're having a second life with it. Mahoney currently sucks about 400 million pounds of grease out of dumpsters nationwide. It's cooking up plans to retrieve a billion by 2030. Even though sustainable aviation fuel is two or three times more expensive than the fossil alternative, the airlines are demanding it. Facing public backlash over its climate footprint, the industry has set an aggressive goal, net zero carbon emissions by 2050 and it has no other short-term alternative to fossil fuels. It's a drop in fuel, so you don't have to modify anything to use it. Um, you, know, you don't have to build charging stations for airplanes and all those types of things. So to me, that's, that's the logical next step. Globally, sustainable aviation fuel production will likely reach nearly a half billion gallons in 2024, a six-fold increase since 2022, and yet still only one half of 1% of the 99 billion gallon annual burn rate for jet fuel. In 2021, the Biden administration launched a sustainable aviation fuel grand challenge. The goal is to produce 35 billion gallons of SAF in the U.S. by 2050. But to get there, Greece is not the only word. There won't be a silver bullet. There won't be one commodity that will satisfy the 35 billion gallon target. Jerry Tuscan is director of the Center for Bioenergy Innovation at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. He says oil from fryer grease, soybeans, and corn can produce a third of that goal. Adding hydrocarbons to existing ethanol production can address another third, and the rest will have to come from new crops dedicated to energy. He says 20 to 40 million acres of land will be needed. There are about 900 million acres of farmland in the U.S. We can have it all and not have to make a choice between food and fuel. There is enough land potentially available to produce 35 billion gallons of aviation fuel. It will take a portfolio or a mixture of species geared toward an adaptive production in specific regions. The Oak Ridge team is partnering with 17 other institutions, including the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, home of the Center for Advanced Bioenergy and Bioproducts Innovation. Agronomist Emily Heaton is a professor in the Department of Crop Sciences. We are at the stage where we're testing uh, the first iterations of making jet fuels from the, the bioenergy crops that we have today. She gave me a tour of their energy farm, where they grow, tweak, and study so-called bioenergy crops. When you say bioenergy crops, what are we, what exactly are we talking about? We are talking about crops that are used uh, to capture carbon out of the atmosphere and used in place of plants that captured carbon out of the atmosphere millions of years ago, which are fossil fuels. The carbon that renewable fuels emit when burned is offset by the CO2 absorbed as the feedstock grows in the field. Because the cycle does not unearth any ancient carbon, 
It is called net zero. One of the leading contenders for sustainable aviation fuel is Miscanthus gigantis, a hardy, fast-growing perennial grass plant that thrives on go. marginal land in cold climates. Oh, wow. Little, uh, it's doing yeah. well in here, huh? They're getting pretty big. It's about time to cut them back. Did you bring the machete? <laughs> we actually have several. <laughs> Inside this greenhouse, they are crossbreeding Miscanthus with sugarcane hoping to add fatty compounds known as lipids to it to make the conversion to aviation fuel cheaper and easier. So how much growth is this? How long did it take for them to get this big? So for a mature plant, this is a single growing season's worth of biomass. It can grow 14 feet high, but that's just half the picture. You can start to get a feel for what's below ground. There is an equal amount of biomass beneath the surface. And if you include the avoided fossil emissions because we're not fertilizing very much, we're not tilling, and it's storing things below ground, it comes, comes back carbon negative. Not just zero, carbon negative. The energy farm is outfitted with a million dollar network of air, water, soil, and weather sensors to verify the true carbon budget of these crops. But ultimately, it will be the budget of farmers that will determine the success of these ideas. It's a chicken and egg problem. As I learned one morning when I visited Emily's parents' farm, 20 miles west of Verbana. So you can put a wire in here, here, and here. John and Connie Cavaney are focused on pasture-raised beef and lamb. They know a lot about growing grass. But right now, it's not a viable option for most farmers the streamlined infrastructure that makes this such a productive place to grow corn and soybeans does not exist for grass production. If you're thinking about growing grass that ultimately might fuel an airplane, the system isn't set up for that, is it? No, it's a, it's a long way off. To entice farmers to grow energy crops, they will need new equipment, financing, and crop insurance. For now, it's a field of dreams. Except if you build it, the market may not come. Our best use for miscanthus right now is uh, animal bedding. That's it? That's it. We plowed up a lot of it. But this family is undeterred. Energy crops not only offer benefits for the climate, they also improve the local environment, reducing runoff and improving soil health, adding diversity. Getting back to our roots, using contemporary carbon to base our society instead of fossil carbon is a, is a choice that we need to make if we are to persist on this planet. And still freely travel around it without carrying a lot of excess carbon baggage. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Miles O'Brien in Boston.